Okay, welcome to everybody who's come to join this important discussion. Is planting trees the answer to climate change? Um, I am Tom Beckett. I am the founder and director of Better Century, um, which is a platform which can help everyone navigate how to live more sustainably through their homes, living, money and transport, as well as, well as how they can influence the places where they live and work. This is one this is one event of many which we're running as part of our digital event series. Um, and, you know, following this, we will have, be having events around plastics. Um, and last week we had a, a, a very interesting event about is money for or against the climate crisis. Um, we will be recording this event so that everyone can get access to it um, and we'll be publishing it through YouTube um, and through a podcast. Um, a few housekeeping of points for those attending. Please ask questions through the event when, when they come to mind by using the Zoom webinar chat function. Um, you can go about putting those um, questions in, but bear in mind that for all of those people which are attending, we have taken a log of all the questions which you've asked to date, and we will be addressing those. The, the event is run for one hour, with the format being three to five minutes for each member of the panel on the subject of the, of the afternoon. We will be recording this event so it can be shared beyond the existing audience. The event is for those who wish to understand how much is planting trees an answer to climate change? Should we be planting trees or should we be letting nature do that? Is there enough space for all the trees the political parties have pledged to plant? Is planting trees the best thing for our ecology? Are there better ways to capture carbon naturally without the active planting of trees? is the answer simply to make more space for nature and trees will plant themselves. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the panelists. Matthew Ern will kick us off and he's from Set Up Cool Earth. For so, for so many years, we thought that the buying of the rainforest was the answer to maintaining the biodiversity of places like the Amazon or the Congo. Cool Earth has turned our proprietary thinking on its head. They ensure continued ownership of these forests by those who can maintain them the best and who want to be in them the most, the indigenous people. They have created partnerships with tribes across the world to look after these forests and relate their, those efforts to real savings in carbon emissions, water and biodiversity. Matthew is a thought leader in the space of maintaining biodiversity and will bring some incredible insights into how we should maintain land effectively in order to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. Belinda Gordon joins us from the Green Alliance. The Green Alliance is essentially the think tank for all UK-based environmental NGOs. It does the research for the movement and creates incredibly powerful lobbying campaigns. The organisations part of the Green Alliance represent over 10 million people in the UK. Belinda leads on strategic direction of the organisation and is currently leading on, on Brexit. We welcome Belinda's assistance on this important topic of discussion ahead of the election and possibly Brexit, but who knows? James Lloyd, notably James used to be the head of environmental policy for the Liberal Democrat Party ahead of the 2010 general election, where he briefed Nick Clegg. James was, has since established schemes to cut carbon emissions across the National Trust portfolio of properties and now works with a focus on raising nature up the climate agenda. James is now director at Nature for Climate, which represents 15 international organisations. I won't include all the acronyms, but they also include UNEP and UDBC, which form a coalition of organisations fighting for nature-based solutions. Nature for Climate advocates for nature being a being a third of near-term climate solutions. James joins from Madrid, where he will be, where he is currently at the UN Convention on Climate Change. So without further ado, I would like to welcome each of our panelists to give their three to five minutes. I'll start off by giving Matthew Owen a chance to introduce himself and to give his three to five minute introduction. Welcome, Matthew. Tom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, many thanks uh, Tom for uh, giving us um, this opportunity, I think it's going to be a really interesting debate and of course for Better Century for putting together such a terrific uh, format of discussions at this important time. Um, we're in the middle of an election campaign so I'm going to start off with the focus of this election campaign, namely the Royal Family. Her Majesty the Queen is 
the tree planter in chief of our nation. Um, she's picked up more shiny spades around the Commonwealth than anyone else we can think of. So I thought it'd be a good example to look at um, her Majesty in terms of what she's done for tree planting over her 67 years on the throne. Because uh, if we're going to follow an example, then that doesn't seem a bad one. If you add up all the trees that her Majesty's planted in everywhere from um, uh, Antigua to Zambia, then she's planted about 35 a year. She generally plants hardwoods, she generally plants trees that are about four years old, so they look fairly good. And goodness, have they looked after well. Uh, they're watered, they're guarded, they're pruned correctly, and uh, pretty much every single one of them has reached full maturity. If you add up every single tree Her Majesty has planted, um, she's pretty much sequestered something in the region or been responsible for sucking CO2 out of the air and turning it into biomass for about 400 to 500 tonnes of carbon. An impressive number. Um, a very impressive number because obviously most of us aren't going to be able to do that. We don't have the land, we don't have the, uh, the uh, cachet overseas. Um, if you were to look at that though in terms of uh, how that would look in a forest, then we're looking at two hectares of tropical rainforest. Two hectares or about four football pitches of land in Angola, DRC, Brazil, you name it. Which makes it look slightly less impressive, particularly when we think that an area of that land is disappearing at a rate of pretty much every second at the moment. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. Tree planting is very important, and uh, as I think uh, all three of us will be uh, agreeing on, no doubt, at the end, uh, we need to plant more trees, we need to think about how we actually make that a more effective, sustainable thing to do. But at the end of the day, tree planting is dead easy. It's tree growing that's the difficult bit. Um, tree planting is something that many primary schools uh, in spitting distance of here are doing uh, day in, day out. Ensuring that in 30 years time, um, those trees are still actually on land that has the tenure to protect them, they're still being supported and they're still actually doing the job we want them to do is really, really tricky. Which is why when we look at trees and their role in climate change, um, I'm afraid we can't yet look at them as part of the solution in terms of tree planting. We need to look at, first of all, the 15% of the contribution they make to the problem, namely land use change and particularly clearance of tropical rainforests is accounting for 15% of total CO2 emissions. Um, I know we're going to be hearing more about this from James, uh, but that means that if we were to actually address those senseless destruction of rainforest, we can pretty much get a third of the way which we need to in the next 10 or so years to keeping warming within one and a half degrees centigrade. So as I said, it's actually the solution is sorting out the problem initially rather than doing something more proactive. Does this mean that tree planting is tokenistic? I think where we stand at the moment in the midst of the current uh, uh, conference of the parties, which um, one of our members is attending today, probably the answer is yes. It's something that we need to think about, but when you compare it to the extraordinary amounts of emissions that come from land use change, particularly in the tropics, it's something we really need to address. Now, Cool Earth was set up to do a very simple job, namely work with local communities who benefit enormously from living in wonderful rainforest and therefore was, as uh, Tom said at the start, the best people to keep those trees standing. We're now protecting trees in uh, Peru, in DR Congo, in Cameroon, in Cambodia, in PNG. And the thing that works best is because we're not preaching, we're not taking control of land, all we're doing is helping to ensure that people make a better livelihood from keeping those trees standing than they do having them cut down. And while we do that at the village level, I think we can take exactly the same approach to the national level. Um, and I might as well say this early on, <laughs> bit of controversy out there, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, um, the president of Brazil, was absolutely spot on when he said that Brazil should be given 40 billion a year to keep the rainforest across the Amazon intact. That is such a valuable environmental resource, not just in terms of carbon, but also water, oxygen, biodiversity, that for us not to pay for that to be protected, having cut down all of our own forest, would be unjust to say the least. The other important thing to say, though, is that um, this is forest that, because it's at the, within the um, uh, tropics, has maximum amounts of rainfall, maximum amounts of um, 
uh, sunshine. And therefore, if we're going to think about planting trees, it's there that we need to do it. It's reforestation of the Amazon and of the Congo Basin and of Southeast Asia where we need to focus. It's lovely to plant an ash tree in the UK, but in actual fact, that's a long way down on the list of the priorities. And I'll stop there, Tom. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was uh, wonderful. Um, and within your five minutes, which, uh, you know, we were, we were pleased about and slightly worried about before this event started. So, well done, Matthew. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, moving over to Belinda. Belinda's going to give us a bit of a perspective on um, Green UK um, and, and, sorry, from the Green Alliance and give us a little bit of perspective about what can be achieved in the UK um, and give us a bit more of a national perspective. So I'll pass over to Belinda. Hi, Belinda. Oh, I haven't unmuted her. There we go. I've unmuted her. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. I unmuted myself. Uh, thanks very much, Tom, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to take a bit more of a sort of UK perspective uh, than Matthew, um, because that's largely where Green Lance's focus is. Um, and um, and also, you, you know, we're we're a think tank. We're aimed at sort of influencing politics and policy. So. I want to reflect a little bit on the incredible tree planting pledges that are in all the main parties' uh, manifestos, um, quite sort of front and centre. Um, uh, so I think you know we can. Everyone, everyone likes a tree, and we can all support uh, tree planting domestically. Um, and I think there is an element. And Matthew and I were talking about this before the um, before the webinar started. That you know, if we are going to support other countries. In maintaining their their uh, forests, um, which you know I think is a, a really valuable thing to do, then we need to kind of lead by example and um, and ensure that we are planting woodland um, domestically as well, having cleared most of our woodland, um, you know, uh, uh, over the last hundreds and thousands, hundreds and uh, thousands of years. So we, you know, it, there's, there's a question of sort of, you know, we, we can't be hypocritical. We need to lead by example and show that we want to plant and protect our woodlands as well. Um, and um, um, so it's fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic to see these manifesto pledges. Um, that they're, they're, we've done a bit of number crunching. They're quite hard to compare because uh, the different sort of different parties have pledged either areas areas of woodland, number of trees, or percentage of woodland cover, but we've made some assumptions about sort of um, uh, tree density. And you know, they're all pretty good, and they all come at least close to the recommendation of the Climate Change Committee of the number of trees that we need to plant by 2050 uh, 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 to meet our, our net zero uh, emissions commitment. Um, so that's great. But, and of course there's always a but, there are two things I'd like to say. Um, so one is none of the manifestos uh, have any detail about how they would actually achieve what in all cases are, are ambitious tree planting targets. And this has been a really hard nut for governments to crack over the last uh, few decades. You know, the government, the current government is way off its, um, its current tree planting target. And that is because they just haven't worked out the mechanism by which to get landowners to plant trees. So I don't think we should underestimate the level of challenge in actually achieving those targets in the UK where land is a scarce and very valuable resource. Um, you know, interestingly, Friends of the Earth, Guy Shrubsol's done some really interesting work on this, and he's also written a blog comparing the manifesto commitment. But the Friends of the Earth have calculated that, in theory at least, there is enough land in the UK to, uh, to double tree cover, which is Friends of the Earth's target. But actually, the re reality of making that happen and of um, bringing, persuading landowners, bringing communities with you um, is is very challenging. And the other thing I'd like to say, which I think is sort of similar to what Matthew was saying, is that tree planting has a role to play in meeting the UK's um, net zero target. But when you look across the board, it is a relatively small role to play. There are many other um, uh, changes that we must make to our economic system and to our lifestyles and to our government policy if we are to achieve those net, that net zero target. 
Green Alliance has done um, produced a publication called um, um, Getting to Net Zero Now, which sets out what those policies are, crunches the numbers, and shows that how they can get us on a trajectory to to net zero. And they are things like retrofitting our housing for energy efficiency, moving to EVs, increasing you know onshore and offshore wind. And of course, trees have a role to play, but uh, it is it is a relatively small one. Um, but we must do all those things. It's no longer a case as it was perhaps 10 years ago of having a choice about which sort of which climate change actions we took. We must do all of them and trees do have an important role to play in that. Thank you very much, Belinda. That has been um, a very, very quick and very effective rundown of, um, I suppose, UK policy in this area. Um, and also gives us a lot of food for thought over, you know, how the, will these manifestos actually achieve these goals? Will there, will, will there actually be enough land? Um, so some really important questions raised there. I'm going to pass now over to James Lloyd, who's going to take us through, give us a little bit more of an international perspective, maybe touch on this from a policy perspective on a national level as well, in response to the other points which have been raised by Belinda and Matthew. So I'll pass over to James Lloyd. Now I'm going to unmute you, James, so please don't do that. Oh, no, there you go. You, you mute yourself. Yeah. Hello, James. Hello. Thank, thank you for joining us from COP, from, from COP as well. It's very kind of you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Better Century, for uh, inviting me to join us. Apologies if there's uh, a noise behind me. Um, it, it gets a bit lively here sometimes, especially at lunchtime as it is now and suddenly actions pop up all over the place. So if I have to suddenly jump up and move, um, it's not that I've run away, it's just I'm finding a quieter spot. Um, so thanks, yeah, I'm here with a, an organization called Nature for Climate, uh, which is a coalition uh, of international NGOs uh, and intergovernment agencies such as IUCN, Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, um, but also a number of UN agencies, which is uh, UNDP, Development Programme, um, UNEP, and the Convention on Biodiversity. And Nature for Climate uh, was set up with, with a very clear challenge, and that was to raise the profile of nature-based solutions for climate change off the back of a, a, a science paper in 2017, which showed that what we call natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions for climate um, could deliver up to 37% of near-term solutions to climate change 2030. Um, that was spread across 20 different pathways, everything from preserving intact ecosystems which is uh, you know, kind of at the top almost of the hierarchy, but also in agriculture, um, in blue carbon, man which is kind of mangroves and kind of coastal ecosystems, um, but also wetlands and, and, and different forms of forestry, which I can go through. So trees uh, might be the, the specific thing planted, but the collection of trees can be arranged in a number of different ways, um, which is really important in policy terms. But anyway, off the back of that, research was done and interestingly uh, 18 months ago when the coalition was established natural climate solutions or nature as part of the overall climate conversation internationally was potentially a third of the solution we reckon um, and it receives only less than three percent of overall climate mitigation funding so actually there was a, a huge inequity there so seeing the UK government uh, and, and all the different political parties in this election publishing their own pledges in their own different ways around trees and nature is a really welcome shift because for many years we didn't see that commitment to nature or that recognition of nature as a solution to climate change. Now, it's really important to put this context. I think what you'll hear a lot of today is the power of the word and. So this firstly isn't an excuse for business as usual. We have to have deep decarbonisation of fossil fuels. And what we need to get behind with it, the real questions we need to ask is what is the motivation behind this nature? Is it a recognition of natural, the value role of natural climate solutions? Or is it seeing trees as a means of offsetting or, or just avoiding um, making some of the tough decisions that we need to make in other areas of the economy? So, you know, I believe it's a power of an and. Um, giving the wider context, uh, a piece of work we've been working on, a very good report recently by Club of Rome, is about the planetary emergency that we sit within. And the reason we use the word planetary emergency, not just climate emergency, is we're seeing this triple challenge that we have in the next 10 years. Is one is reversing biodiversity decline. We're seeing massive collapse in biodiversity at the same time as seeing climate breakdown, at the same time as a huge development challenge that we need to meet around the world. And to a certain level, jobs and, and economies are changing fast in the UK as well. Now, the key to this conversation is how we plant trees or put natural climate solutions in, in a way that delivers and meets those three challenges. And that's what's so exciting about nature-based solutions, because if done well, they can not only reverse biodiversity decline, 
but they can also be a major solution to climate change and also deliver uh, uh, development needs um, for many of the world's poor. If, if those three things are done, it takes us a long way to what I call a regenerative economy. Now, the key thing when I'm listening to a policy from government is, it, is this just that people have caught on to the idea of planting trees, okay, or is it truly a commitment as part of the Green New Deal uh, to move to a regenerative economy where they're seeing that actually, ultimately, the UK can take, start to take a leadership role in understanding the role of not just a deep decarbonisation uh, and move and transition to low carbon energy, but also the role of a regenerative economy and how we work with nature to be nature positive in all our decisions at the heart of what we're doing. Now, going back to my previous role with a hat on, I helped write a manifesto a good decade ago or so. Well, it's changed greatly since then. But actually what was interesting is that you might start off with a, a policy which was around a, a move to ecosystem service, payment for ecosystem services and, and restoration of ecosystems. But often by the time it got through the manifesto, it ended up being tree planting. So, you know, I'm giving a bit of credit due, and I, and, and I like to always think positively to the political parties, that actually when you focus group something, people get trees. And the role of a manifesto is to speak to people as a whole. Um, and in communication terms, people love the tree. Uh, as a symbol of ecosystems and nature and, and, and I think we're seeing a bit of that here um, but at the same time I think there's also a recognition of these double challenges of biodiversity restoring our ecosystems in the UK and I hope this is something as we move forward that the UK has a really important role to look at internationally next year I'm sitting here at COP25 now next year COP26 is going to be in the UK in Glasgow and I hope whichever party wins the election they can take that leadership, not just in showing through restoring and hopefully doubling Britain's tree cover and restoring precious ecosystems, but also about how they can support globally similar moves for people to do three things. And what we're, we're kind of saying in policy terms is one, the top riches is protecting um, intact ecosystems. So protecting those primary ecosystems, so those forests that Matthew talked about uh, around the world, but also our ecosystems within the UK, where we have, um, native forest cover it's really important to protect that when people often talk about tree planting they talk about numbers of trees i actually prefer people to talk about carbon and sometimes to be clearer because actually we know that intact ecosystems deliver 40 percent more carbon uh, drawdown than you would have in a plantation so actually when you do tree numbers it can drive a policy towards plantation whereas if you're talking about carbon actually can drive you towards ecosystems restoration so protecting is top restoring is next uh, the, 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 the manifesto is uh, way they're written was talking about planting trees. Actually, in many ways, trees will help grow themselves. So there's a whole sense of just letting go and letting nature naturally restore itself. And in many ways, that's a much cheaper option than planting the trees. So in some cases, it's restoring those ecosystems, letting nature, just, just giving nature a hand, but letting go and letting it naturally restore itself. And in other cases, planting. But I'm not totally against the concept of plantation because also a key part of our decarbonisation is looking at the building materials we're building things from, moving more to wooden buildings, um, and actually making that saving of moving away from cement and concrete. And that can be done in two ways, both in our buildings and our, and our construction, and we need wood for that. And secondly, actually the way we protect our towns and our coastline from floods and climate change, actually we can use nature to do that as well. So there's a role in a way we're building resilience and, and, and adapting to a changing climate. And then the really important bit is, you know, once you plant those trees, the management of them is absolutely key. So it's like, how do we then manage those for the next 40, 50 years as we move forward? And there's many different ways of managing them, and I'm not going to that. And then finally, it's the funding. So, you know, we can't meet the climate challenge without funding. That's about both make sure we're funding the right people to plant the right trees in the right places in the UK, but also funding people internationally to follow and, and, and to restore those ecosystems. There's many people in the world that have very different economies to, to, to OECD economies and actually nature is a key part of that and actually helping them to restore and, and in many cases learning from them that indigenous knowledge, those indigenous ways, we've got a lot to learn from how people manage nature in their other economies but sometimes those people are also crying out for us to pay our fair share uh, and help other countries restore those habitats, reverse biodiversity decline and, and then hopefully Britain being the start of this, the one thing that my colleagues internationally are amazed is that all our political parties have got announcements about trees. That's not seen in a lot of other countries in their political. So we must recognize that, you know, and partly the Green Alliance's great work over many years, building that political consensus around climate change, but actually we're in a race to the top here rather than a race to the bottom as we're seeing in many other countries. And I think that's really important to recognize. And I hope the UK can take that leadership, whichever party wins through to next year and use 
the 2020 to kick off this massive decade of restoration or regeneration that we need to see as we emerge from this emergency that we face ourselves. So I'm hoping that we can find that uh, an opportunity to do that. So <laughs> people come in and say hello. So thank you very much. I uh, hope that was, how was my time in there, Tom? Did I go on too long? I think you've done quite well, James. Thank you very much indeed, um, and has kept us in in the timing quite well. Um, I kind of I, 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 we've got a number of questions from um, already from the attendees, um, and also a number of questions which I've kind of got stored up before. But I wanted to kind of do something around kind of clarification around the manifestos to begin with, because you know in some ways this event is in response to the manifesto pledges around planting trees, and I think one of the things which is probably good for us to kind of get to the bottom of is. Are the manifestos pledges saying we should plant trees or are they saying that we should just make space for nature? Um, and I think that's just quite a straightforward question, which I'll kind of put to, first of all, Belinda, um, and then also ask that to Jane. So Belinda, have you got a quick answer to that question? Um, yeah, well, quick. Um, it, they, they, they use different wording. Mm. And so, for example, the Conservative manifesto talks about, um, I think it's 20, you know, ex thousand hectares of new woodland mm -hmm. so it, it's ambiguous on whether it's planting or natural regeneration and to be honest I don't think we should get I, I don't think we should get too hung up on it because I think there is a role for both and natural regeneration can be cheaper so I'm sure political all political parties would love that option. <laughs> yeah uh, and same question to James I'm just gonna I'm trying to meet you don't do that uh, there we go so I think Linda's right. I think manifesto is a bit of a hostage to fortune because you are writing in the way that communicates to people. I think if you put it in the context of the agricultural bill going through Parliament and some of the kind of greener UK work, you know, I, I think there is a recognition of the role that ecosystem payments for ecosystem services provide and, and, and what behaviour change that will drive across farmers um, in, in many of our degraded, presently quite degraded landscapes. Um, I think the, the, the Labour one is a hostage, unfortunately. It does say planted, plant trees. Um, I, I, I think that, that might just be, I, I would just probably put that down to a drafting error. In reality, on that scale, I think what they're trying to do is meet the, the, the doubling UK woodland cover um, mm -hmm. kind of commitment because a number of trees equates to that. And, and people question whether you could actually plant that many trees. Well, actually, in Ethiopia, over one weekend, they planted 200 million trees or something, some ridiculously high number. I'm not suggesting we, we go down that route. But actually, if you do include natural regeneration, you can be talking about those kind of numbers being planted, just giving space, uh, naturally growing. Um, but I think I wouldn't really want us to go too detail into those exact wordings, because I think in reality, when these things hit the white paper and come through, then actually the, the intent is in the right direction. And I support that. OK, thank you, James. So, I mean, what we're reading into that really is that the Manifesto Pledges are, are really about trying to create more space for trees and trying, trying to create more space for trees to be planted to tackle the climate crisis, which is fantastic. It kind of helps hone our discussion here. Um, I'm going to quickly rattle through some of the questions which have been asked pre-event um, and go about kind of rattling through those and we've condensed those into kind of four main areas which I really want to kind of cover off. Um, so we've had from Tina Irving, is uh, if the Scots are so keen on climate change, why do they want to launch a rocket on peat bogs? Um, that's a kind of reasonable question. Uh, Jocelyn Murgatroud, um, how do we ensure trees are planted in the right places? Is this, is this a distraction from looking at our soils, oceans, etc.? Um, Luc de Montfort, I hope I've got the pronunciation of that right. How realistic is implementing effective alternative carbon negative methods? Some things like carbon capture. Um, I think that's kind of interesting point. Uh, Rose Cash and Pugsley, um, could planting trees be used in carbon offsetting? And how effective would that scheme be? Um, is that something which we should be doing nationally? I suppose that kind of question points to. Um, Rachel Hazel, um, Labour are plant, pledging to plant two billion trees. I hope this isn't a stupid question, but where do we get all the trees from in order to plant that many? I think it's a very good question. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Chris Walker, is coffee an environmental no-no? Um, Jamie Hartzell, the big question is surely where to plant them? In catchment areas, flood plains, how much work has been done on this by those in the know? And once we know that, who owns, the who owns that land and will they, will they agree to trees being planted? 
Nick Argent. As well as this topic, I'm interested in carbon forestry and its contradictions in ethics. Diane Ballard, I am concerned about, tr about tree planting on habitat that is already useful as unplowed meadows, which sequester carbon and feed pollinators, also for birds and skylarks and kestrels. Adrian Lawson, is natural regeneration a better way of getting trees to grow them than plant them? Uh, Alice Groom, what is the role of natural regeneration in increasing tree cover in the UK? Um, and Oif Blanchard, Wirral Council is looking into tree planting scheme as part of their climate emergency action plan. So we're interested to hear more about its effectiveness and and and, uh, and I suppose in comparison to other projects. Um, and something which is also coming in, how much has been invested in renewable technology rather than natural solutions? Um, we expect maybe 100,000 to one. Um, how do we change that balance? Um, so I'm going to kind of go through four key themes. What is the role of natural regeneration? How do we avoid monocultures? Um, uh, what is the role of other habitats in sequestering carbon? Where is the right location for trees and where will we get the trees? And how will we maintain a mosaic of habitats to ensure we maintain good biodiversity? But to start with, what is the role of natural regeneration and how do we avoid monocultures? So I'll kind of open that up and I'll, um, I might ask Matthew to start. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Have you unmuted me? Yeah, I've unmuted you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it's a big one. Uh, planting trees, as I alluded to earlier, is, is very easy. Uh, growing them to 30 years is tricky. It's a lot easier to plant a plantation than it is a natural forest. Um, and uh, I think everyone will probably guess why that's the case. Uh, it's also very difficult and takes a very, very long time to create a forest that actually is uh, fully populated with every level of the food pyramid in there because um, insects, invertebrates, the like will take a long, long time to return. So the simple answer is actually natural regeneration is by far the simplest thing to do. Um, the problem is it is, takes a very, very long time to do and it's quite difficult to control. It also looks a bit scrubby in the early days. Um, I'm sure many of the people on this uh, 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 call have um, read uh, the books about rewilding that are roundabout. And um, certainly in the early days, it's generally scrub that's protecting the small seedlings before the oaks and the uh, beech and the elms can get through. So often from a, uh, a point of view of the aesthetics, it's maybe not the way to go. Which brings me back to my earlier point. Um, if it is so difficult and so expensive to create a natural forest, shouldn't we be spending a bit more time on protecting the ones we've already got? And I think that goes for my earlier point about um, uh, the rainforest of the world, but also the forests and natural habitats of the UK. I think Jocelyn made a really good point about um, shouldn't we be worrying more about our soils? And to be honest, if we're talking about carbon and carbon protection um, in the UK, then we need to consider our soils as our rainforests, because that's where the carbon is stored. And actually ensuring that those aren't depleted and degraded and lost by the virtual you know, um, cubic miles a year, uh, then looking at uh, planting small copses is, is, is really uh, fiddling while Rome burns. And this goes back to the general point. Um, planting trees does give the sense that there is an easy and cheap option to actually involving nature as a solution to the climate crisis. There's not. It's immensely expensive. And if you look at the uh, sums that have gone into renewable energy, they dwarf the sums that have gone into forestry by well over 100,000 to one. And until we actually start deploying some of those resources to things that we understand how it works, we understand how to do it, and we have good evidence that it has worked in the past, then uh, we really are missing the point. Thank you, Matthew. That's excellent. I will pass over to Blinda on the same question. So um, what is the role of natural regeneration? How do we avoid monocultures to Belinda? I'm unmuting you, Belinda. There you go. I think you're in. There we go. I'm gonna... Oh, Oops. there Sorry. we go. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think sort of James and Matthew have, have, have both sort of touched on this, that um, natural re regeneration is really effective and reading something like Isabella Tree's book, Rewilding, is, is, or Wilding, is, is um, really inspirational on this, but that won't work everywhere. There has to be a seed source, you know, it, it still has to be a sort of lightly managed process. So, you know, it's a cop-out answer of actually, I think there's a role for natural regeneration and planting. In terms of avoiding monocultures, I, I'd like to go back to what James said earlier, which I think is absolutely right. I think, you know, that there is a role for plantations, and, um, but you can now do them, um, there, there are now sort of standards where 
even if you have a sort of softwood plantation, you know, the, the sort of classic um, sort of, you know, fir trees that we <laughs> have been planted in some of the wrong places. Um, the, the, you know, you can now mix them with some native woodland around the edge. And so they're a bit more biodiverse, but they do, you know, they, they will play a role in the, in the net zero transition in providing those building materials. You know, we, we import, a, you know, most of our timber building materials and they are, and, and that is a really effective way of locking up carbon. So I think in the right place, you know, there is a role for plantation, but, you know, but sort of managed sensitively. Um, but obviously, you know, we'd all like the bulk, um, the bulk to be native woodland because it has these co-benefits in terms of, you know, biodiversity, in terms of, you know, recreational benefits for people and, and sort of people's well-being. I do want to, um, I, I feel like, you know, we're, this conversation could go could go a bit negative about you know oh it's, it's you know it's all really difficult and we actually ought to be doing this first and and actually I think you know as James said the sort of manifesto commitments and the sort of cross party consensus on dealing with climate change and on on trees playing a role in that is something to be celebrated because it could actually you know make all our lives much richer if there's more woodland around more biodiversity you know more recreational opportunities so I think that's to be celebrated and there are ways of making it happen but you know there are challenges as well. Yeah they're very good and, and I suppose as part of that question Blinda I kind of wanted to come back and maybe weave in another one of the questions which is you know is there really enough space for a kind of regenerative approach to planting all of these trees? Um, you know we kind of pointed to the fact that we it's difficult to find the land for these types of things. Um, you know, is there is there going to be space for it? Is there a way of making that work? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is a huge challenge. And as I say, Friends of the Earth have done this sort of this theoretical work to show that there is enough space in the UK. Uh, I think it's the UK uh, for uh, not just England for a doubling of tree cover. So theoretically, there is, but making that a reality when the incentives aren't in place for landowners to you know, lock up their land use effectively for future generations by planting woodland on areas of their land. So the incentives have got to change. Um, and, um, but I guess, you, you know, you could, you could do a sort of, you could um, have sort of differential government policy to encourage kind of natural regeneration or planting schemes sort of as they're most appropriate. But I think we're a long way off. Um, so actually, a lot of the questions kind of asked about where, you know, where would we plant them? Do we know where the right places are? And I think the answer is probably not actually at a very sophisticated level. And something we are oh, time for a plug. Something we argued <laughs> in uh, in a report we did earlier this year about cutting the climate impact of land use is that there needs to be, you know, government needs to take a spatial approach to this uh, and to actually start sort of mapping. Where, where trees should go and providing extra incentives in those areas where trees are most appropriate. Uh, so to ensure they go in the right places. And I think we're a long way off that at the moment. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Belinda. I'm gonna pass it, I'm gonna kind of pass over an evolution of this question onto James, which is a bit unfair, but um, James, um, so I wanted to um, kind of ask you, I suppose we've, we've got this, this issue around space and monocultures, um, and whether we can find enough space to do all of these things. I'm really focusing on the UK at the moment because that's what the interest is from our attendees. Um, how would we find the right amount of space? And, and, and do, we, do we let regeneration be the answer to that? And, 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 and is it possible you know, to, 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 to do that? Or do we, do we, do we need monocultures? What's, what, what's your ideal mix? So, so yeah, I mean, zooming back a bit on it, I think what we know is we know that doing it at bigger scale is more cost effective. We know that doing a bigger scale that you can share knowledge against multiple landowners. Um, and, and I think what we are talking about here is landscape scale or catchment scale approaches to this. And, and I know there's some absolutely excellent work being done. I mean, clearly there's, there's net uh, and kind of showing what rewilding looks like. And, and then, you know, if people want to know about this, you know, go there, <laughs> experience it, feel it. Uh, you know, it's, it's more than just a technocratic approach to to planting trees or looking up, there's a spiritual dimension to this. And, and I also think that's captured really well in some of the work around the kind of Caledonian forest in Scotland, where people see the value of this kind of restoration of ecosystems to be fully functional ecosystems, both because they deliver products, they deliver cultural things, um, there's a cultural dimension, but there's also the biodiversity and natural dimensions. It's a multi-dimensional approach, 
But at the heart of that, it's about using GIS and some of our mapping approaches to look at those landscapes and look at where the best function of how you make each part of the ecosystem functional to deliver multiple benefits. Now there's some great work and give a plug for Green Alliance did as well about looking at the stackable benefits of land. So no one payment probably for one outcome is going to deliver this. It's going to be multiple. So some is about water, some is about slowing the streams so with a flooding benefit. Others it might be about clean air or it might be about carbon or it might be about biodiversity. So there's a number of stackable benefits in an ecosystem that we can deliver. And I think we need you know, clearer guidance about how moving away, if Brexit happens, moving away from CAP, some of those payments to landowners will happen. Some of our uplands are massively degraded, but they have a whole cultural uh, landscape within that, which is really important about how you work with farmers and not vilify them, so that you're actually understanding how they're custodians of those landscapes. And they actively want to make those landscapes better and look after them. You know, looking, putting planting around our rivers is a really important thing, restoring some of those riparian parts of our ecosystems but in other cases you know when you talk about numbers you know i'm a great believer that all the schools in the country that have these metal fences around them if you put a tree and put even proper hedgeland or native forest or edible forests around some of our schools and actively built the biodiversity corridors into our schools you know there's, there's a huge opportunity of connecting our kids with nature but also bringing a generation that knows the value and planting a lot of trees and that probably would be planted trees in our towns and our cities but in our in, in our in, on our, our to say wilderness but in our, in our countryside less the wilderness you know there's a different approach and even in oxfordshire they're looking at it wildlife trust in oxfordshire uh, is starting to do some work looking at the whole landscape of oxfordshire and how you could build natural climate solutions into that but deliver multiple benefits so what happens in oxfordshire would be quite different from mid wales where they got the summit to see to what's happening in caledonian forests provenance is really important right trees right places on the plantation part of it there probably will be plantations in there but monocultures are never brilliant anyway as a plantation because they're susceptible to disease resilience some of the impacts of climate change so having that mixed woodland and different trees and then reducing our impact on our logging and selecting clear trees rather than clear felling the whole lot you know forestry has moved on it's using good quality what we need to avoid is what happened in parts of ireland where tree absolute tree numbers was the policy driver and you ended up with monoculture plantation often on peat box and they, they, they plowed through them, they damaged those peat bogs, which are a really important part of our restoration, and planted spiky trees. What we want is to be sensitive to the ecosystem, restoring its functions, but planting the right trees in the right places, and knowing that biodiversity is our friend, because we are facing climate change, and our ecosystems need to be made more resilient, and the best way of making an ecosystem resilient is the diversity within that. And, and that, that's why it's really key that we restore that in our farmlands for our soils, looking at agroecology and other techniques. You know, so, so it, it's not a simple one size fits all, but it's the other side of it. It's really exciting because that needs new skills, new people. It needs like landscape architects, skills that we don't even know about now. You know, and that's why I think youth has got really behind this nature climate uh, intersection because they see the value of jobs good jobs that you would really want to do and go out and, and, and do that and you could proud to come home and tell people what you're doing so this next decade of restoration or regeneration could be incredible uh, and then we need to make the kind of green new deal thinking more than just net zero and start to think about what a really truly regenerative economy looks like with a circular bioeconomy being heart of that and how nature a nature rich world feeds into that rather than just about renewables versus fossil fuel debate it's a much more exciting world that I think we could be creating and harnessing the power of that. Well, I mean, you're very passionate about this, James. Thank you very much indeed. And, and also a really, really nice kind of, I suppose, sweeping kind of narrative about how this might be achieved. Um, there's been a few questions coming in about, I suppose, what kind of space should we be leaving for nature and, and, and how do we do this? I mean, well, it's probably worthwhile kind of reflecting on what you're achieving over in um, some of these rainforests as well. You know, how are you getting those trees planted? Is there, is it using natural regeneration? How are you engaging people in that process? Um, and, 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 you know, how do we fill that kind of skill gap, do you think? Uh, tree planting is a small part of our Call Earth's work, um, although increasingly important to be honest going forward. We'll probably be talking about it a great deal more in the, the years ahead. At the moment we're very much focused on uh, keeping what's already standing, but one of the things we've noticed over the last five years in particular is that a lot of the forest loss is no longer driven by uh, industrial style deforestation type of clear cutting that James was alluding to. Um, I know, to create space for uh, crops or palm or grazing, um, but it's actually smaller patches being taken out 
often linked to the growing family size. And um, something that we sometimes forget about with rainforests is that these nations are often post-conflict nations. So in the case of Peru with the Shining Path, in the case of Cambodia, in the case of Cameroon, sadly not yet post-conflict, obviously DRC is uh, quasi um, post-conflict, all have had that 1945 moment in recent years, namely people come back from war and start having much bigger families. Mm. So the stress and strains that actually domestic demand for food is an incredibly important driver of forest loss. And where we've seen gardens, as they're often referred to, be cleared on a greater than necessary scale, we have worked hard to figure out ways in which we can actually regenerate those areas or possibly improve the productivity. Uh, and a key area for us actually is planting uh, a tree called Inga. Inga is a, a tremendously valuable native to South America, which is able to retain stocks of um, uh, uh, potassium and uh, phosphorus, more importantly, in the soil. So uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, those are the things that every uh, growing um, uh, plant needs in some form. And if you lose them, it goes. And the trouble with rainforests is they grow on a very narrow compost heap of their own making. Once you cut down the trees, the compost heap gets washed away quickly. So we focused on growing these trees, which are very much the uh, pioneer species for others. Um, if you've ever been to the rainforest and put your hand on a piece of open ground, the leaf litter is probably about 60 degrees centigrade if it's in the sun, and nothing will germinate. So you actually need these trees to create uh, the shade, to create the conditions and the moisture and the nutrients for others to follow. And it's taken us five years to figure this out, and it's going to take us another 20 years to get it right, which I do think demonstrates just how complicated it is to regenerate. Rainforests will regenerate on their own, but it can take anything up to 50 or 60 years. If that whole um, uh, soil biome's gone as well, it will take even longer, and possibly they'll go to Savannah and never to recover. So the species you have to plant are not always the easiest ones to find, and actually getting the right mix of species takes a great deal of time. Um, but the selection is, is far from easier, and I, I do worry that um, when we talk about natural regeneration, for example, in the UK, we forget that we have, you know, a growing season for maybe eight or nine months in this country at best, and therefore it takes many, many years. In the tropics, the uh, uh, biological productivity is four times what we have in Kent, for example. And I think that's something that we all need to remember when we talk about natural regeneration and the pace that it needs to take. That's really useful. And uh, Matthew, I know you do a lot of advocacy over in these countries as well. Um, do you advocate for, you know, particular percentages of areas to be maintained for forests? I mean, should we, should we be doing the same in the UK? Um, you know, should it, should it be uh, that, that, a percentage in, in the UK? Uh, we, we don't, and there's no harm and fast rule, mainly because uh, Cool Earth Endeavours to have every single one of our strategic decisions regarding forest protection taken at the village level. And mm -hmm. uh, that's not because, um, you know, we're, we're so much more enlightened than other people. It's just if it's taken there, then that decision is owned and it tends to be um, far more persistent and sustainable. Um, rather than use percentages, we, we use the simple rule that um, if forests used to grow there and it came down, it should go back up. And if that works with the um, aspirations and the ambitions of the community, then forests will regenerate where it used to grow. Trying to replant a savanna, trying to replant a ravaged um, uh, soil, this area, is really problematic. And as uh, James alluded to, the peat bogs in um, Ireland, we do need to recognise that nature chooses uh, where best to put forest. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I wanted to come back over to Belinda again and, and, and ask her about this kind of percentage space which we should be allocating. Should it be numbers of trees or should it be around the percentage of the UK which we allocate to natural regeneration? Um, I think this is a really important question um, because we've got these specific tree planting targets. And also we've got, also which has come through the attendees has been some points around you know, development pressures. So we know that there's a huge amount of development being created. How do we make sure that, I suppose, we reflect the development pressures which are going on in the UK with the kind of natural space which we allocate for um, things like trees and natural regeneration? Um, so, yeah, so the, the um, Climate Change Committee um, uh, in their uh, net zero trajectories have said that we need between 17% and 19% woodland cover by 2050 if we're to get to net zero by 2050 and we're currently at 13%. That doesn't sound like a huge increase but actually it, it is <laughs> uh, and, and it's quite challenging. 
Um, so, um, uh, Sorry, I can't remember this. What was the second part of your question, Tom? It was really around development pressure. How do we reflect that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, you know, there are different figures about the amount of land uh, that's developed. You know, I think I think the actual amount of land that's developed in in this country is pretty small. It's like two percent, but or, or uh, no, it's, uh, maybe it's um, a bit more than that. But when you look at the effect of that development on the surrounding countryside, it's a much bigger area. But I don't think it. Uh, I, I don't think it needs to be either or. I mean, um, we do need more uh, housing, more affordable housing. But I think there are way. You know, there are some really good examples of developments that are, um, you know, new housing developments that are not only kind of highly energy efficient. So they're they're getting us on the transition to net zero um, yeah, through our building stock, but also have sort of built nature into those developments. And so developing an area of kind of, you know, of kind of uh, agricultural land can actually be an opportunity to build houses that are needed, but also to plant the trees that are needed. You know, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some evidence about kind of, you know, the increase in the value of houses if they're, you know, if, they're, if there's lots of green space and trees around. And I think developers, you know, certainly the more enlightened developers are sort of catching on to that. So I think it can be an opportunity for both. And um, I think there was a question from someone uh, uh, in the Wirral uh, earlier. I, I think, you know, using um, sort of built up areas and uh, the tree planting is just fantastic because it brings so many co-benefits in terms of reduced air pollution, reduced temperatures in, you know, the increasingly hot summers we're getting, reduced flooding and, and kind of, you know, the aesthetic, the kind of well, mental health well-being benefits they bring. So I think, I think we should get away from thinking, oh gosh, you know, um, land should either be used for this and that. You know, we're in a country that has got very limited land and we need to look at del delivering multiple benefits from each, each piece of land. And, and kind of following from that, how do we make sure that our kind of ambition, ambitions for trees don't hinder our ambitions for things like meadows and floodplains and other yeah. kind of spaces which are helping maintain a kind of really lovely mosaic of habitats in our country? Yeah, well, it does, it does come back to um, the, you know, the stuff that James was talking about, about kind of using GIS, using technology to actually, you know, take a spatial approach to where those trees need to go and to incentivise um, landowners to put them in the right places. I mean, you know, the, the, the most valuable kind of wildflower meadows are protected by triple SI status that, uh, that would be kind of, it would be illegal to plant them with trees. But um, um, but uh, someone, I think, in a question mentioned the proposed nature recovery network, which um, we're hoping to get in the environment bill, whichever government uh, uh, is, uh, wins, uh, whichever party wins next week. And that would be a kind of network of areas. And that, that I think, uh, and there would be requirements on local authorities to sort of plan those nature recovery areas. And I think, you know, that, that's a really effective way to go to sort of take a holistic look, not just have one person thinking about where can we put all these trees, but take a holistic look to, you know, how we need to improve our biodiversity and the sort of mosaic of habitats that are needed and where these things can go. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to kind of touch on very briefly is like, how do you think this should all be subsidised and how do you think it should be funded? And I've kind of moved that question over to, to, to James as well, but do you have an idea about how this should be done? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, is, there, there is, you know, one of the upsides, the best answer here, to, to Brexit has been the opportunity to think beyond cap. It's been given us a chance to say, okay, what are the public goods the public money should go towards? Uh, when we're paying our farmers. And, and one of the clear, I suppose, leaders and people thinking it is around ecosystem services, the multiple benefits, whether that's about how we're managing our water or about how we're putting biodiversity or other things. And I think that there is some recognition that actually if you move to more of what we would have historically called Villa 2 in cap approach and paying farmers to deliver public goods and benefits, then actually that's probably the way forward and probably the best use of public money um, to help you know farmers work with our ecosystems in a way and in that case there will be some money in other spaces and actually interestingly being part of Europe has also meant that it's been very difficult and impossible for the UK to offset because the ETS doesn't cover land use as part of that um, I think technology and our way and our understanding of land use has massively evolved since the ETS was written it's probably right at the time but now actually if you look at the role of, of land use and the opportunity of having properly verified monitored 
and, and well done, underpinned by regulation. And I think that's important to say we're not mis-selling offsets, but they're clear what they're delivering. And I think there's an opportunity of stacking those benefits in there. We presently have biodiversity offsets within the planning system. Um, and I think actually, if you look at landscape restoration on a larger scale, so it's not done at individual farmer level, I think there's an opportunity of building those nature recovery networks, but the coalitions around that, which can also then have a kind of more centralized funding group for a catchment that can then funnel the funding into those farmers based on almost like 25 year contracts like they would have with a feed-in tariff when you're building solar panels, but actually having a contract with the funders that can then apply for some of the bigger grants. But ultimately in the early days, this is going to be expensive. So there is a role for impact investments, communities investing in that, fundraising. And, and the biggest is about following the science, being rooted in the scientific approach to our landscapes. Each landscape's different. We need to look at it, we need to follow that side. And I think the role of some of our big NGOs that have a huge amount of experience in this, but reaching beyond their borders, working together in coalitions, in catchments, and actually pulling that and actually working with landowners, collaborating um, in, in a way of moving to this kind of regenerative approach to our, to our landscapes and our local economies, I think is a really key way forward here. So that communities are at the heart of that and we're less of this kind of protection preservation mentality of those people are bad, we're good, we're doing, you know, and actually moving to a more collaborative approach where, where everyone is much more uh, enlightened about nature. So actually you can have those decent conversations about what is right and appropriate to avoid. And there will be mistakes in this process, but we have to learn and share from those. You know, we're not going to always get it perfect. And I think it's about, and what's great about having political consensus here is we can probably move into a much deeper policy place rather than just fighting over the very principle, which is where politics generally ends up. So, you know, I, I'm excited what the next few years will hold. Um, but there is certainly challenges and, and I think communities getting behind that and, and making it clear to their politicians once they come into power and elected that, that you know, what's happening, well, how are we going to go and do this and, and move this policy forward would be a really exciting start to the, to, to the new political term. Yeah, well, that, that's great, James. I'm going to ask you just to say a few words to sum up and, and really respond to the question. We've got plenty of people out there who have joined this, joined this to, as listeners to figure out what they should be doing practically. Um, and, you know, should they be going out and planting trees? Should they be lobbying government? You know, what should they be doing to ensure that we make sure that we get a wonderful ecosystem which actually tackles climate change in the long run? Um, and I'm going to pose that question to everyone to kind of try and close up this session and then close up the, um, the event itself. So, James, could you respond to that question first? Sure. So this is political, right? This is an election. Nature is political. <laughs> it's an issue. We're seeing one in six UK species in decline at the moment. The UK is destroying its, its natural ecosystem, yet it has one of the largest membership conservation organizations okay so something's not right there that there's the political will yet our actual experience our lived experience is showing nature in decline so immediately i, I think we, we we need to look at how we we write that wrong um, and, I, and i think the key is taking this big and making this political but also you know in our own what we can do you know actually london is driving massive destruction of ecosystems around the world just by the investments we're doing so when we're making investment decisions having that due diligence that understands the impact on nature in the same way we're just learning about how investors make those decisions on fossil fuels we need to do the same around deforestation so like 30 times as much money is going into destroying globally our ecosystems than is going to helping them to relieve so we need to re what we call defund deforestation but readjust that balance um, and, and the same, I think, is in the UK, is having that political attention, putting that money in, but also making sure that people in their everyday lives know how they can kind of engage and, and the benefits of nature can bring. So, you know, I, I see it political, I see it political change. And I think we also need to demand that our, our political parties have a very clear vision about what this low carbon world that we're wanting to look like is. Um, and in many cases, I, I think they've got bits of that. But actually that needs to be a positive vision as much as some of because there will be things and people affected by our change away from climate change but we also need to deliver that clear vision of what a future economy looks like and, and that should be for political debate in itself wonderful thank you very much james um matthew same question to you what should everyone be doing to make sure that we look after this all uh, i think three things um i mean it maybe elections will keep on coming around with the same frequency as they seem to be but uh I would take the opportunity of writing to your new MP, which will be in you know, pretty much two weeks time when they start getting their offices in Westminster and asking what their voting intentions on carbon and the role that nature plays in the climate crisis will be. Simple as that, get as many people, young and old, to ask them and just hold them to those uh, answers going forward. 
Uh, secondly, um, be local and you know support your local wildlife trusts. That they are the backbone to actually protecting uh, British nature, and uh, they're the best place to start. Um, and then thirdly, support Cool Earth. Uh, cool Earth. <laughs> I sort of wave the flag at some stage. Cool Earth does something very simple. Uh, tries to figure out ways of keeping the most valuable ecosystem for addressing the climate crisis intact by empowering and making more resilient the people who benefit most, namely local people. Um, support us, learn about us and become ambassadors. Uh, that's uh, three things to put on your to-do list. Wonderful, thank you very much, Matthew, and very clear as well. I like the three things. We have, um, I'm gonna weave into this question for um, Belinda, a question which has come through from James Murray White um, about the political pressure as well. Um, so in answering this question, I also ask you to say, what can everyone do? And is the political pressure which are being put forward by the likes of XR having a real impact on these type of things? So that's to Belinda. Um, yeah, so I think the simple answer to that last question is yes. I mean, there's undoubtedly the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion have created a space in which organisations like Green Alliance can put forward policy proposals to actually address um, address the environmental and climate crisis, and and they are being listened to much more. So. I think that pressure has made an enormous difference and it's also made environmental organisations like Green Alliance take a look at ourselves and say, you know, are we acting like our house is on fire? No, we've normalised things a bit. We need to up our game a bit. So I think it's been fantastic. Um, in terms of what people can do, I, you know, absolutely number one thing is write to your new, you know, vote based on, um, you know, who you think's got the best policies uh, to deal with the climate and ecological crisis write to your new MP, engage with them, put pressure on them. Um, but, you know, I think there are also individual things we can do in our lives. We haven't talked today about dietary change, um, but, you know, if we all eat uh, a bit less and better quality meat, we will free up more land that can be used for, you know, other types of food production or tree planting. Um, you know, try and fly less, you know, and by all means plant a tree, you know, they, they, they are amazing things that, um, that sort of enrich all our lives. Well, that's fantastic, Belinda. That really kind of allows for me to kind of help sum up quite neatly and say, you know, there are tons of things which you can do to live more sustainably. There's tons of ways and choices which you can take to help contribute to the climate and ecological crisis. But essentially provides a platform where you can learn about your pathway to being making that change in your own life um, we've got excellent guides around reducing your personal carbon footprint we've got seven ways to reduce your personal carbon footprint you know we've got challenges which you can take we've got tons of information which everyone can dip into um, you know from guides to buying an electric vehicle through to experiences of putting up solar panels in their houses you know we've got a huge depth of information which people can tap into and people you can ask to have support to live more sustainably so please do come and join us as an organization and, and as an individual to go and help grow a massive community of change makers um, we at better century are looking to find the solution and together we can we can be that solution to the climate and ecological crisis. Um, we thank everyone for attending this event. Um, all of the panelists are giving their incredible insights to this to this challenge. Um, and you know there are obviously some voids which we've um, we've left within this kind of discussion around which should it be um, the the political party which have offered to plant as many trees as possible you should be backing or should it be those which have said the least. But you know I, I think that what's really come through from this debate is that actually this is about how they do it and, 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 and how that's achieved and planting really and probably most of the manifestos has really meant you know allowing for more trees to be planted. Um, I'm sorry we didn't quite get to that question around how we would get two billion trees and how we would plant two billion trees um, but that's quite a challenge unto itself and, and something we didn't dip into in much degree but we would like to say thank you to all of the attendees, all of the panellists, thank you for all of the amazing questions. Come and join Better Century, come and be part of the discussion um, uh, on an ongoing basis. And I'll just ask each of the panellists to say goodbye. So from James, thank you for joining us from um, COP25, I believe it is. I'm trying to unmute you, but I failed. There we go, James. You want to say goodbye?
So thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and, it, and it's great that we're having this conversation, and that, that, that's a real breakthrough because in our previous elections, I just don't think we would have had that. So thank you, and thanks to Matthew, your great projects and, and, and really great work, and Belinda, you know, hats off always to the work. The fact we're having this conversation is partly down to the great work of the Green Alliance building that political consensus. And thanks to Tom, Better Century. I, I love the framing. I think that's what we need to start thinking about, is what is this better world that we're creating? Thank you, James. And from Matthew, thank you very much. Matthew. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Better Century. And uh, thank you for a far wiser uh, bunch of uh, panellists. Really, really interesting to hear what they've been saying. Thank you very much, Matthew. And um, a goodbye from Belinda, and I and and thank you there as well. Yeah, thanks very much. One closing thought about um, Extinction Rebellion and stuff is, and, and everything we've been talking about, is that it, it is fantastic in this country that we have managed to maintain uh, or create a political consensus across all parties on the need to act on the environment. And so, you know, I just really hope that we keep that race to the top rather than, you know, what's happened in the States where it's become, where environmental actions become associated just with one party. We haven't got time for only one party to take action on the environment. You know, we need to keep that political consensus and, and so far it, it's looking positive. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'll sign off from the event now and um, yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye to everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye.